I am still as strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. Joshua 14, 11. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever it happens to be that you're listening to the Legion of Michael podcast. Welcome. Welcome one and all, and thank you for being a part of the student, of the, I'm sorry, the Legion of Michael listening audience. Yes, indeed. Remember to go to legionofmichael.com. That's legionofmichael.com. If you go there, then you can sign up for the church security program, the Legion of Michael church security program. You can start the quiz right now. You can take a quiz. What is your level? What is your church's level of security right now? You can take that quiz. And, of course, there's uh, lots of other stuff that you can do. And if the enrollment is closed, that's fine. It's it's all right. Just put in your name, your email address, and uh, you, you get on the VIP waiting list, and you'll be informed when enrollment is open. And of course, as always, if you'd like to support the show, we'd encourage you to support the show, whether it's monetarily or supporting it by leaving a review or telling other people or what have you. It'd be great if you told other people about this. That'd be fantastic. All right. Is your church weak? Is your church weak? Uh, I've been working, I've been reading, uh, there's an upcoming book from my late friend, James Yeager. And he talks about the the aftermath of a shooting, the aftermath of a deadly force encounter where you might be forced to use deadly force to save your own life or the life of innocent people. And after that happens, for a person who's never had to do it, or even if you have had to do it once or twice, uh, it can be difficult psychologically. And you need a support group. And James talks about, he talks about where you can go for support. But in the book, he writes the following. He said, Unfortunately, being a church member is not a guarantee of support. We actually had a congregation turn their back on one of our students one time after he got into a shooting. This is before all church shootings uh, got in vogue. I remember back when they thought God would protect you in church, and now they figure out, They figured out that God said you should protect yourself in the church. Now these churches have security teams, uh, which means the people who were already carrying guns in church now officially carry guns in church. God wants you to be armed. I just wanted to say that. James Yeager from his upcoming book. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, James told me, we talked about that uh, in person, and he actually uh, referred to it uh, during his interview on the Legion of Michael program, how they had a, a guy who had, was in a justifiable shooting. He wasn't a murderer. He actually had to use a firearm to stop someone from hurting him, from hurting his family. And his church body actually, not notionally, they literally turned their backs on him and shunned him. Now, when I hear things like that, it makes me sick to my core. That is not, a, let me tell you what, uh, I'm going to go ahead and preach a little bit. That is not a body of Christians right there. I don't know what it's a body of, uh, but that is not a body of Christians. When you have a person who has is forced into a position where they have to save their own life with a, with a firearm, use a firearm to save their own life, and then you turn in their hour of need when they need the support the most, you turn your backs on them. That is a, I don't know what you call that. That's not a church of God. That's a church of Satan. That is a church of weakness, loathsome weakness. In the book of Acts, Christ is talking to his followers. But he said to him, it is not for you to know periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set 
by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest part of the earth. You will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And in some translations it says the strength of the Holy Spirit. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God does not call upon Christians to be weak. He doesn't want us to be weak and subservient. He does not want us to bow down to the whims uh, and the wishes of man. No, he actually wants you to be strong. He calls upon you to be strong. You need to be the strongest amongst the people, whether it's in your community, your city, your church, whatever. Whatever. Weakness. Weakness in your church body. And this is when you have to say, well, how am I supposed to know before it happens if my church is weak? There's a lot of signs. There's a lot of clues. Did your church shut down during the COVID scare? Did they bend the knee to the whims of man? Did your church require people to cover their faces and sit six feet apart from each other? Did your church tell people not to stand and sing praises to God because they're not allowed? If your church leadership ever said to you, the congregation, we're not allowed, that's when you need to pause, raise your hand and say, excuse me, not allowed by whom? Not allowed by whom? Well, uh, we're, we're not allowed by the state. We're not allowed by the county. Oh, the county, the state is not going to allow you. So man has decided that he is stronger, smarter than Jesus Christ. That man is more, is in charge, and God is second to man. What's, what is the first commandment? What is the, what is the first commandment? Uh, thou shalt have no other gods beside me. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if your church fathers, if your church body, if they bowed down to, well, to man, to the minions of Satan... You remember, and I, I cannot say this enough, people say, well, I mean, um, I mean, um, that we're not allowed. The, the county commissioner or the county health officials said, we're not allowed. And that's when you say, oh, so you are more powerful. You have greater authority over my spirit and over my soul than God himself. Okay. Because God commanded us to put him first. God commanded us to uh, honor the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. God commanded us to gather together where two or three are gathered in my name. I am there with them. Now, the sinful. Remember, Satan quoted the Bible. Satan quoted Psalms to Christ when he was tempting him. Just because you know how to quote the Bible, you've memorized a verse or two, or someone says, oh, well, uh, Jesus said, render unto Caesar. And he said, render unto Caesar. That means you have to be subservient. You have to be subservient up to the point where the state usurps the power of God. You see, the moment the state usurps the power of God, you no longer have to listen to them. Yeah, but what if they throw me in jail? Um, would you rather be in jail or would you rather be in hell? Would you rather have the punishment of man or would you rather have the punishment of God? Would you rather have eternal damnation or temporary inconvenience? Oh, but you don't understand, Paul. Yes, I do understand. The words are there. Now, those who say, oh, well, what about, what about the book of Luke? Luke 20. In, in Luke 20, uh, Christ said, render unto Caesar, didn't he? 
Yes, he did. And I actually read that this morning. And I think that uh, what we forget is Christ wasn't just sitting around and he said, hey, give me a coin. And they handed him a coin. And he said, uh, a denarius. And he said, you see this inscription here on this coin? That's Caesar. You need to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. You know, that, that scenario, that scenario came about, that story came about because of the, the blackness of man's souls, because of the sinfulness of the souls of men. You see, if you start at verse 19, Luke chapter 20, verse 19, he said, when the scribes and the chief priests realized that, that uh, Jesus had spoken this parable against them, so rather than they, they realized that he was talking about them during the previous parable, they sought to arrest him in that hour, but they were afraid of the people. So they watched him closely, and they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. And these spies were hoping to catch him in his words, in order that they could hand him over to the rulers and authorities and the governor. Teacher, they inquired, we know that you speak and teach correctly. You show no partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance to the truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus saw through their duplicity. You see, that whole thing with the show me a denarius and whose inscription is on it, and they said Caesar, and he said render unto Caesar, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. That all came about because of the sinfulness of man, the treachery of man. The Jews, the Hebrews, rather than say, hey, this is the Messiah that has come to save us. This is the one spoken about by David and Isaiah and Elijah and, so, and the prophets and John the Baptist. This is the guy we've been waiting for. Rather than say that, they saw him as a threat. They're like, oh, this guy is a threat to our power. So being presented with their treachery, with their duplicity, with their lies, Jesus, if nothing else, Christ Jesus was the most patient man, because he was son of man, to ever walk the earth. Because he knew, he knew they were trying to trick him. He knew that they were lying to him. He knew they were trying to deceive him. (laughs) Think about it. If you had the power of Christ, if you had the same power of Christ, and these evil men came to you, to deceive you, to try and trap you, to try and trick you. You guys, you're like, I would turn I would turn him to stone. And then we just walk away. <laughs> I'd turn him into a pillar of salt and then we'd walk away. I'd break the wrist, walk away. But Jesus said, Okay. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and unto God that which is God's. I'm going back to the weakness of your church. If your church said, well, we can't blank, or we're not allowed blank, are we, were we commanded to not render unto God that which is God's? What is Sunday? It is the Sabbath day. It is the holy day. It is God's day. It is not the day of your county health commissioner. It is not the day that belongs to your governor or your mayor. No. As a matter of fact, if the governor, if the mayor, if the county commissioners, if the health commissioner, if they were acting in the behavior or acting in the way that Peter commanded, that they were supposed to be, I'm sorry, Paul, that Paul commanded, they should be encouraging you to sing praises to God. You see, your governors and your mayors, then instead of saying you're not allowed to go to your churches, you have to, you can go to Walmart, and you can go to Kroger, you can go to Home Depot, you're allowed to go there, but you're not allowed to go into your church. You see, instead of doing that, they should have been telling people, get into church and pray for God's forgiveness. Turn your hearts and your souls back to your God. That's what they should have been doing. But instead, they were doing the exact opposite. They were not acting as God's representatives here on earth 
Instead, they were acting as Satan's representatives here on earth. And my question to you is, how did your church react? Now, I know that there were faithful servants of God who said to the church, go ahead, or I'm sorry, who said to the state, go ahead and arrest me. They arrested Peter, and the angels came and broke the chains and took Peter right out of that prison. You remember that? Yeah, you should. It's in the book of Acts. Who is your heavenly father? Who is your father? Who is in charge? Is the mayor in charge? Does the mayor own your soul? To whom do you owe allegiance? When it comes to putting God first, when it comes to the Sabbath day, to whom do you owe allegiance? You owe allegiance to man? To minions of Satan? Or do you owe allegiance first, number one, to God, your Father? And after we have fulfilled our commitments to our God, after we have fulfilled those commitments, then if you want to give your time and your money to the state, then go ahead and do it. If you want to give your obedience to the state when it comes to superfluous nonsense and garbage, go ahead and do that. But step number one, commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me, Period. End of sentence. For I'm a jealous God. Then say, well, if if your mayor says, don't worship me, and if, if you do worship me, I will put you in jail. They put Peter in jail. They martyred Stephen. Stephen refused to be silent, and he was martyred for the name of God. Were you martyred for the name of God? Well, I don't want to. I, I, we can't go to our church because... Because the county health commissioner said we're not allowed. Oh, did the county health commissioner martyr you? Did the county health commissioner throw you into prison? Well, 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 no, but to whom do you owe allegiance? Ladies and gentlemen, if your church leaders displayed weakness in 2020 and 2021, and maybe they're still displaying weakness, What do you think is going to happen when it gets really hard? When it actually gets really difficult? Because the nonsense of 2020 and 21 and so forth was nothing compared to the tests that are to come. There are much greater tests that are coming for the United States of America and for this world. And if your church could not stand up to that nonsense, if your church could not stand up to a rogue health commissioner or an out-of-control mayor, what are they going to do when the tests become actually hard? In Luke 21, verse 11, Christ was talking to his followers, and he said, there will be great earthquakes, there will be famines and plagues in many lands. And there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. Are you prepared? Is there strength within your church? We talked about that. We talked about the Holy Spirit. Have you prayed for the... I mean, all of these so-called church leaders that bowed down, they've bowed down to secularism. They've invited evil into their congregations. They embrace the rainbow not as God's promise as it was intended, but as a sign of perpetual evil. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a house of God. It's a house of something else. It's not a house of God. Because a house of God is supposed to be filled with men who are courageous who display strength. You see, courage is contagious, and so is cowardice. We have to ask ourselves, and you say, well, if I cannot change this church, you say, but you don't understand, Paul, I'm just one guy. I'm just one person. I can't change the church. I can't make the church leaders turn away from their weakness and their slavishness and their desire 
to bow down to the wills and the whims of man. I can't, I can't change that. You see, what did I just say? Courage is contagious, and so is cowardice. If your so-called church leaders are displaying cowardice, that is going to be contagious to the congregation. A lot of C's in there, I know. You see that guy who's standing up in front? He is supposed to display courage and strength because by displaying courage and strength, then it will become contagious for those who are sitting out in the pews. What have we seen? You have witnessed it. The, the great thing, the wonderful thing about the years 2020 and 21, and even so much, even so far today, is you cannot act surprised when a person displays cowardice or weakness or they bend and the knee to, to Satan and Satan's minions. When they grovel before man, You can't act surprised because you saw it. You witnessed their behavior. You witnessed the behavior of men when strength was required of them, and instead of showing and displaying strength, what did they do? They folded like a house of cards. They're like Christ said. They're they're like the man who built his house upon the sand, and the winds blew, and the storms came, and they collapsed. And great was the disaster. Great was the fall. Because they did not build their foundation upon Jesus Christ. Their hearts were not filled with the Holy Spirit. They did not worship and look to God their Father as their ultimate authority. No, instead they looked everywhere else. They look to the weakness of men, to the evil and the slavishness of men. What did Christ say to his followers? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am yet there with them. You say, but but my church, there's a lot of people in my church, and I can't change it. And just because the, you know, the 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 church fathers or they're they're weak or they're 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 slavish, or just because they, well then, what am I going to do? Leave. Leave that congregation of weakness. It is better for you to be with two or three other genuine believers than it is to be in an entire room filled with weakness and slavishness. Because what good are those people? What good are they going to be? The moment that Satan, they're like the seeds that fall amongst the thorns. They fell, those seeds fell on the path. There is no root. As soon as the sun comes out, as soon as it gets hot, as soon as they are persecuted, they will fold and blow away like dry grass in the wind. What good is that group of people? What good are they? You see, everything I just said, I didn't make up. It's right there in the book. All of these lessons have been given to us. That is the greatest gift that God could have possibly given us other than his son, Jesus Christ, was his word. All you have to do is pick it up and read it. I didn't make this up. I didn't, I didn't make any of it up. I'm just reminding you, it is my job. The Holy Spirit is in my heart, and it's talking through this black microphone to remind you of what God said. Remind you of who really is important. Who is your actual father? To whom do you owe your ultimate allegiance? To a governor, a mayor, a county health commissioner? You you owe them your ultimate allegiance, and then after you've bowed down and groveled and licked their boots, then, then maybe there might be a little of your time and attention left over for God. No, no, that's not how that works. That is not how that works. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being members of the Legion of Michael. And if your church is run by strong men, you need to bolster that strength. You need to not take that strength for granted. You need to not take that courage for granted. Because it's far easier to just fold and be weak. We've seen that. We've witnessed that for three years. We've witnessed the weakness of men 
the weakness of men in our churches who are supposed to be the leaders, who are supposed to display courage. I would ask that the Holy Spirit come into your heart right now, this very minute, as we say this prayer. It's the warrior's prayer, not the coward's prayer. Lord, I come before you seeking the strength and skill to overcome my enemies. Grant me, I pray, the wisdom to recognize evil, the courage to confront it, and the strength to destroy it. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.